Rivers and streams flow more steadily because of the snows melting on the mountainsides, whereas their volume of water varies much more widely and more erratically where there are no mountain ranges, as in tropical Africa, where rainfall alone must sustain these waterways, or fail to sustain them. The Sierra Nevada in Spain and the Taurus Mountains in Turkey both supply the water that makes a flourishing irrigated agriculture possible on the plains below, where rainfall alone would not be sufficient. In another sense, however, uplands have a negative effect on rivers, which must plunge more sharply downward, often with rapids and waterfalls, when the streams originate at higher elevations, whether on plateaus, mountains, or foothills. Rivers with steep gradients tend to be less navigable, or not navigable at all. Mountain ranges also drastically affect rainfall patterns. When moisture-laden air blows across a mountain range, it is not uncommon for the rainfall on the side where the moisture originates to be several times as great as in the rain shadow on the other side of the mountain, where the air goes after it has lost most of its moisture while rising over the crest. The net result is that people located on different sides of a range of mountains or foothills may have very different agricultural opportunities. On some western slopes of southern Italy's Apennines Mountains, for example, the annual rainfall reaches 2,000 millimeters, while parts of the eastern slopes get as little as 300 to 500 millimeters. Similarly, in the American Pacific Northwest, precipitation on parts of the west side of the Cascade Mountains averages up to 10 times as much as on parts of the Columbia Plateau to the east. Different sides of a mountain range often have not only different amounts of rainfall, but also different slopes. This has had important military implications, where the people on one side have found it easier to climb the gentler slope and then descend upon the other side to invade their neighbors. The locations and shapes of mountain passes have also had other military, and consequently cultural, impacts. The greater ease of Roman soldiers' entry through the mountain passes into Gaul, as compared to the more difficult mountain route into German regions, meant that Roman culture reached Gaul first, and only later filtered second-hand into the lands inhabited by Germans. Coastal peoples have also tended to be culturally distinctive. In touch with more of the outside world, they have usually been more knowledgeable and more technologically and socially advanced than interior peoples. As with other geographically related social patterns, these are not racial, but locational. Sometimes the coastal peoples are racially or ethnically different, Germans being particularly represented on the coastal fringes of Russia at one time, for example. But the differences between the interior and the coastal peoples remain, even when they are both of the same racial stock. Thus, in the Middle Ages, the largely Slavic population of the Adriatic port city of Dubrovnik was culturally far more advanced in literature, architecture, and painting as well as in modern business methods, than the Slavs of the interior hinterlands. In tropical Africa, likewise, the coastal peoples more in touch with outside influences were sufficiently more advanced technologically and organizationally to become enslavers of Africans farther inland. One symptom of the importance of coastal areas as cultural crossroads is that many of the lingua francas of the world have originated in such settings whether in the Levant, on the Swahili coast of Africa, or in the ports of China and Southeast Asia. Soil, of course, has profound effects on the kinds of agriculture that is possible, and therefore on the kinds of societies that are possible. A pattern of farms that are passed down through the same family for generations is possible in fertile regions, but not in places where the soil is exhausted in a few years and has to be abandoned and a new site found while the first land recovers its fertility. Whole societies may have to be mobile when the land in any given location cannot permanently sustain them. This means that there cannot be cities and all the cultural developments facilitated by cities. Mobile slash-and-burn agriculture has been common in those parts of tropical Africa and Asia, where great cities failed to develop and where the indigenous people long remained vulnerable to conquest or enslavement by peoples from more urbanized societies and larger nation-states elsewhere. In early medieval Europe as well, Slavs in East-Central Europe practiced slash-and-burn agriculture, which necessitated very different forms of social organization from those which emerged after the use of the plow enabled them to create sedentary societies. Moreover, 
Just as the nature of agriculture has influenced where urban life is or is not feasible, so the economic and technological advances associated with cities influence agriculture. Thus, in the 16th century, the hinterlands of such flourishing cities as Venice, Milan, and Genoa saw great improvements in agricultural methods introduced. Deserts and steppes, such as those of North Africa, the Middle East, and Central Asia, have often produced societies on the move. These nomads have included some of the great conquerors of all time. Wave after wave of conquerors from Central Asia and the Caucasus have pushed other peoples before them into Eastern and Southern Europe over the centuries, creating a chain reaction series of conquests in the Ukrainian, Polish, and Hungarian plains and in the Balkans, as those displaced moved on to displace others. Less dramatic and less extreme have been the seasonal movements in places where sheep, goats, and other animals are herded in different places at different times of the year, rather than exhaust the vegetation in one place. Here there may be permanent dwellings where the women and children stay while the men migrate seasonally with their herds, as in the Balkans. The significance of particular geographic features mountains, rivers, climate, soil, etc., is even greater when these features are viewed in combination. For example, the effect of rainfall on agriculture depends not only on how much rainfall there is, but also on the ability of the soil to hold it. Thus, a modest amount of rainfall may be sufficient for a flourishing agriculture on the absorbent lowest soils of northern China, while rain falling on the limestone soils of the Balkans may disappear rapidly underground. Similarly, the economic value of navigable waterways depends on the lands adjacent to them. Navigable rivers, which go through land without the resources for either industry or agriculture, the Amazon, for example, are of little economic value, even though navigable waterways in general have been crucial to the economic and cultural development of other regions more fully endowed with other resources. In Russia as well, Waterways isolated from the major natural resources of the country, as well as from each other, cannot match the economic role of rivers which flow into one another and into the sea after passing through agriculturally or industrially productive regions. Conversely, harbors that are not as deep, not as wide, nor as well sheltered as other harbors may nevertheless become busy ports if they represent the only outlets for productive regions in the vicinity as was the case of Genoa in northwestern Italy or Mombasa in East Africa. Similarly, the port of Dubrovnik on the Dalmatian coast, strategically located for the international trade routes of the Middle Ages, flourished despite a harbor that was not particularly impressive in itself. Sometimes a variety of favorable geographical features exist in combination within a given region, as in northwestern Europe, and sometimes virtually all are lacking as in parts of tropical Africa, while still other parts of the world have some of these favorable features, but not others. The consequences include not only variations in economic well-being, but, more fundamentally, variations in the skills and experience, the human capital, of the people themselves. Given the enormous range of combinations of geographical features, the peoples from different regions of the earth have had highly disparate opportunities to develop particular skills and work experience. International migrations then put these peoples with disparate skills, aptitudes, and outlooks in proximity to one another and in competition with one another in other lands, where they seldom have the same economic or social fate. While geographical influences may distinguish one cultural universe from another, even another located nearby, the existence of similar geographical influences and similar social patterns in distant regions of the world, marauding and feuds among mountain men, for example, means that such patterns are not national character or racial traits, but are international in scope and geographical in origin. Nor are these patterns necessarily racial characteristics even in the limited sense of characteristics differing from one race to another for non-genetic reasons. Particular cultural universes may be largely coextensive with particular races, the Japanese culture, for example, but this is not always or inherently so. In short, geographical influences cut across national borders and racial lines, producing similar effects in different countries and different effects in various regions of the same country or among culturally different members of the same race.
This is not to say that there are no national cultural influences. Clearly there are. Language, religion, and political traditions are just some of the cultural values holding together nations composed of peoples subjected to disparate other influences. The point here is simply that a recognition of distinct cultural patterns, whether originating in geography, history, or otherwise, is not the same as a belief in national character or racial traits. These things may overlap or even be congruent in some cases, but they may also be quite separate. While continents or other regions of the world may not be geographically unique nor homogeneous within themselves, nevertheless, the ensemble of geographical influences operating in one region of the world has differed significantly from the geographical and other influences operating elsewhere. These differences are not confined to their original locations, but are also embedded in the cultures of peoples migrating from these different regions of the world. One of the more geographically fortunate parts of the world, in terms of having the natural resources needed for the development of a modern industrial economy, has been northern and western Europe. Iron ore and coal deposits, the key ingredients of steel manufacturing and the heavy industry dependent on it, are concentrated in the Ruhr Valley, in Wales, in Sweden, and in the region so bitterly fought over by France and Germany, Alsace-Lorraine. The broad coastal plains of northern Europe have also provided the peoples of that region with much prime agricultural land and with navigable rivers crisscrossing these lands, knitting large areas together economically and culturally. The fact that Europe has many peninsulas, islands, and numerous harbors gives the continent excellent access to the sea. The Gulf Stream warms western Europe to give it milder winters than places at similar latitudes in the western hemisphere or in Asia. London, for example, is farther north than any place in the 48 contiguous United States, yet it has milder winters than New York City, much less cities in Minnesota or Wisconsin. Eastern, Central, and Mediterranean Europe do not share all these advantages. The Gulf Stream's influence on the climate of European nations on the Atlantic becomes progressively less in the more distant central and eastern portions of the continent, where rivers are frozen for more days of the year and where winters are longer and more bitterly cold. The natural resources required for modern industry are also less abundant and in many places virtually non-existent in central and eastern Europe. The broad coastal plains of northern Europe have no counterparts in the Balkans, where hills and mountains come down close to the sea, and the coastal harbors often have no navigable rivers to link them to the hinterlands. Spain has likewise been lacking in navigable rivers, and Sicily lacking in both rivers and rainfall. These sharp differences in geographical advantages have been reflected not only in great disparities in wealth among the different regions of Europe, but also in similarly large differences in skills, industrial experience, and whole ways of life among the peoples of these regions. Thus, when the peoples of the Mediterranean migrated to the United States or to Australia, for example, they did not bring with them the industrial skills or the whole modern way of life found among German or English immigrants. What they did bring with them was a frugality born of centuries of struggle for survival in the less productive lands and waters of the Mediterranean, and a power of endurance and persistence born of these same circumstances. The ability of the Italian immigrants to endure poor and cramped living conditions and to save out of very low wages, which caused comment among those around them, whether in other European countries or in the Western Hemisphere or Australia, had both geographical and historical roots. Similar characteristics have marked various other Mediterranean peoples, but the Italians are a particularly interesting group to study because they include not only the Mediterranean people of the south, but also people from the industrial world of the Po River Valley in the north, whose geographical, economic, and cultural characteristics are much more similar to those found among northern and western Europeans. The enduring consequences of the different skills and experiences possessed by people from different parts of Europe can be seen in the fact that the average income of immigrants from southern and eastern Europe to the United States in the early 20th century was equal to what was earned by the bottom 15% among immigrants from England, Scotland, Holland, or Norway. Illiteracy was higher among immigrants from southern and eastern Europe. 
In school, their children tended to lag behind the children of either native-born Americans or the children of immigrants from Northern and Western Europe, and their IQ scores were often very similar to those of American blacks and were sometimes lower. Nor was all this peculiar to American society. In pre-World War II Australia, immigrants from Southern Italy, Dalmatia, Macedonia, and the Greek countryside were typically illiterate and spoke primarily their local dialects rather than the official languages of their respective home countries. More than three-quarters of these Southern European immigrants to Australia were from the rugged hills or mountains, the steep coastlines or islands of the region, rather than from the urban areas or plains. Although these remote areas were eventually drawn into the modern world, the skills of their peoples continued to lag behind the skills of peoples in other parts of Europe that were more industrially advanced, and this was reflected in their earnings in Australia, as in the United States. As late as the 1970s, the median earnings of immigrants to Australia from Greece, Italy, or Yugoslavia fell below the earnings of immigrants from West Germany or from English-speaking countries. Southern Europeans in Australia remained underrepresented in professional and technical occupations, and from nearly half among the Italian immigrants to an absolute majority among the Greek and Yugoslavian immigrants were unskilled laborers. Asia has likewise had sharp cultural divisions, many growing out of its geography. The world's highest mountain range, the Himalayas, have separated Asia's two great ancient civilizations, those of China and India, which developed independently of one another to a greater extent than any of the civilizations of Europe or the Middle East. China, in particular, was a world of its own, and clearly the most advanced nation on earth for many centuries. One sign of its preeminence was that Chinese goods were for long in great demand in Europe, while Europe had nothing to offer in return except gold and silver. The compass was in use in China's maritime trade decades before it was introduced to Europeans by the Arabs, and books were printed in China centuries before the Gutenberg Bible was printed in Europe. Chinese silks and porcelain were in demand in Asia, Europe, and Africa. While Chinese culture had a major impact on the cultures of Korea and Japan, and an influence felt as far away as Persia and Russia, there were few external cultural influences on China itself from the 8th through the 13th centuries. Yet very little of China's culture was spread by migration, certainly nothing to compare with the later massive spread of European culture to the Western Hemisphere, not only by the movement of millions of Europeans, but also by the Europeanization of both the indigenous populations of the Western Hemisphere and the millions of descendants of Africans brought to the New World. The Japanese are a reminder that a meager natural resource base alone is not enough to prevent industrial development, though it may prevent such development from arising spontaneously from within the given society. Japan's industrialization was transplanted from Western Europe, notably England and Scotland, and from the United States, as a result of deliberate decisions made by the Japanese government amid a national fervor to catch up with the West. Why this happened in Japan, but not in India, Abyssinia, or the Balkans, is a profound question, with few answers or even systematic explorations. Many centuries earlier, Japan was likewise very receptive to cultural and technological imports from China, which at that point represented the most advanced culture in the world. In short, geography is a major influence, but not a predestination. Otherwise, nations like Japan and Switzerland would be among the poorer nations of the world, instead of among the most prosperous. Even after large numbers of Chinese, Japanese, and Indians migrated to other countries around the world, the cultures they took with them had little or no effect on others outside their own respective groups. To a greater or lesser extent, these migrants from Asia tended to assimilate at least the outward veneer of the Western societies in which they settled, though retaining their own work patterns and discipline which enabled them to rise to prosperity in these countries. The southwestern part of Asia, known as the Middle East, has also sent abroad migrants whose cultural endowments reflect the geographical circumstances in which their societies evolved. Lacking both the spontaneous abundance of food found in parts of the tropics and the natural resources for modern industry found in northern Europe, the peoples of the Middle East have historically had to struggle to make a living, 
whether in the nomadic pattern of the Bedouins of the desert, or in the irrigated farming of others, or, perhaps most striking of all, in the middleman traders who originated in this region and spread throughout the world. The economically strategic location of the Middle East, for centuries a crossroads of trade between Europe and Asia, fostered the development of many trading ports and many trading peoples, of whom the Jews, the Armenians, and the Lebanese have been particularly prominent, not only in the Middle East itself, but also in other countries on every inhabited continent. These kinds of immigrants, middleman minorities, from this part of the world, have had patterns of skills and aptitudes strikingly similar to those of the overseas Chinese, who originated in similarly demanding regions of southern China, where trade was part of their survival skills in a geographically unpromising region for industry, but which had trading ports.